So, uh, hi folks, I'm here today with Pat Gavin, and Pat is the captain and president of the Owego host teams in Owego, New York. Is that correct, Pat? That is correct. And how long have you been in that position? Probably 24 years. So, you, long time. yeah, so you know a lot about it. Um, so my understanding is it began in uh, 1951, and you've got about 68 years going so far. And uh, the host team is an entity that is, it's not the actual Wego Fire Department, but it's a support entity where training can go on and community events and other things. Can you tell me a little bit about that, what they, what they offer as far as the training? I know there's ladder racing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So the, what we call modern era hose racing started in the, in the 50s. Uh, folks, uh, servicemen were coming back from the war and basically they picked up uh, and joined the volunteer fire service, a lot of them. And this evolved, hose racing evolved from that. They, they just started competitions. So the point of hose racing is to basically sharpen your firematic skills. We run three races. One's called the ladder race, as you said, and another's called a Y race, and there's a, a straight lay race. So basically what you're doing, it's all timed events. You're competing against other teams made up of other firefighters, and you're hooking hoses together, hooking up to the fire hydrant. M most everything you do at a fire scene, and you run down the street and you spray down a target, and that whoever does it in the quickest time wins the race, essentially. So my understanding from what I've seen is the ladder race is essentially a fellow running down with a ladder or a gal. They get that, the hose is connected, they're running up and they're shooting that, that target to get, her down, get it down. So most, uh, the races we run, so we're affiliated with the Central New York Firemen's Association. So it's 20 counties in Central New York comprise that association. So, and they host the races. So the races we run, uh, you need five people on a team. And each person on the team has a specific job or task they need to complete. One being the hydrant person in the ladder race specifically. Another, as you said, a guy, a guy or female runs down the street, puts up a ladder, followed by a nozzle person with a nozzle. He hooks the he or she hooks the nozzle up to the hose, runs up the ladder and, and sprays down the target. So really, you're you're working on hydrant stuff, you're working on hose connections, you're working on ladder placement, uh, climbing up ladders, and nozzle operations, spraying you know a water stream to hit a target. And the, the event where the, the hose is connected out, then they disconnect the end and bring it back to a Y and put yep. two hoses on it. That's what they call the Y race? Yep. yep. So at the end of the race, essentially the hoses, their two and a half inch hoses, are shaped in a, in a Y. Yeah. And in that race, there's two nozzles that spray down two targets. I see. Back in the day, there was a race called the motor hose, um, where uh, an actual fire engine would go down the street and the team members would jump off it and can make connections and spray down targets um, while the truck was still moving. That I'm race, guessing the insurance companies weren't providing coverage for that anymore? Or? That and uh, it just, uh, yeah, it, it had its day. They still do similar races to that basically on Long Island, but they're yeah. drag cars. The difference between what they do on Long Island and what we did is the drag cars stop momentarily yeah. and, and the team members jump off. Our, our motor hose race, the truck just kept on going. It went 15 miles an hour. Uh, I got to do that race for, I started at 95, and they probably discontinued that around 2000. So I got to do that for about five years. Wow. We're talking to maybe bringing it back next year, because we're hosting the Central New York Convention next July here in Wego. Uh -huh. And we're talking about maybe doing a demonstration just to show folks that are not familiar with that race what to do. But. Uh -huh. um, yeah, essentially all the races are geared towards sharpening your, your firefighting skills and making you a better firefighter. And it's basically the basics. If you can do it under the pressure of the competition on the street, you can do it at a fire scene. Right? That's the, the whole idea behind it. Right. So if I can put that nozzle on while I'm running down the street during the hose race, get up the ladder and spray down the target in 10 seconds, in theory, I should be able to do that under the pressure at a fire scene when we're actually in, in action. Yeah. When I was looking at the, the Central New York Firematic uh, events, 
uh, I saw a striking similarity to the New York State Central Lifeguard Championships. Okay. And you send teams out there, and everything's for time, and everything's performance related. And when I in my research, I saw that if this is correct, you guys have won 23 Central New York Firematic titles. Yeah, like I said, modern era hose racing started in the 50s. The first time that we got one was 1959 in Elmira. And then the next time was in 72, uh, I forget where, but it's been, so and, and full disclosure, back then they had 60 to 70 teams competing. Wow. Now we're lucky if we get a dozen, unfortunately. But yeah. the, the popularity of the sport has is, is declined, or trying to bring it back, but I have been trying to get more interest from area departments for the past 20 years, and like I said, we get a handful. but. To Owego's credit, we consistently have at least three teams yeah. at every race we do. So that's at least 15 Owego host team members that are, are competing. And we, you know, we get as many as five. Like we had the race over for after the fireman's rededication this past August, we had five Owego teams. Um, so it, it's it's really stayed strong in Owego um, for, yeah. for the better. It's like to me. It's like one of the best kept secrets. I was, you know, I knew it existed, but I didn't know the extent of it, and I didn't know the history of it. And it's re it's really quite interesting, especially if you go to your website where there's a lots more information. Sure. At the end of this video, we'll have the host team's website and the Weagle Fire Department website, so people are encouraged to go and look because there's a lot of history there. If you're a history buff, it's a perfect thing. If you're into sports at all and history, it's yeah. even better. It's really good. Um, so the host teams um, have just completed a historic renovation project, the Baker uh, Fountain, Fireman's yep. Fountain, um, and I think most people that have seen it have gone by. It's just it's a dramatic transformation, and we many are aware of the progress. But I, I want to hear something that nobody knows. What was the big hurdle you had to get over? What was the thing that was all screwy? <laughs> what did the excavator dig up that wasn't expected? Or wow, well, we've, we've got several. I'll give you top five or the top off the list um, so first uh, when we got into the project we just expected it to be essentially a paint job and not really that didn't what, work out for you did it, what it became, <laughs> correct so we got a hold of the Smithsonian Institute which originally cataloged the fountain because it's there's only 14 in the country and there was a woman there who actually had wrote a book about fountains and, and statues specific to uh, war heroes and fire service and she had cataloged and knew all about her fountain. Um, so she put us in touch with a company in Ohio who did the specs for uh, the, the renovation. So right out of the gate, and they were great, um, they were out of uh, near Cleveland. So right out of the gate though, Tom Podner, the head conservationist of his company, um, had some heart trouble. And he's actually on a list to have a heart transplant. Oh my God. So he, that put us back, uh, he was going through his health problems and that put us back at least six months because he couldn't travel. So they had to send a different person out to do the specs and, um, but Tom main, maintained contact with us and he actually carries around a battery which essentially operates his heart. Oh my gosh. Uh, I haven't talked to him in a couple weeks, but he was still in that state. So that was the first hurdle. Um, the Smithsonian recommends this best conservation company, McKay Lodge Labs out of Ohio, and their head conservation guy who started working us had those health problems. So that was a, a big hurdle. Um, so then we got into the actual project, uh, and they, so they've done similar fountains around the country. They spec'd out the and this was the biggest snafu. Um, they spec'd out the pad for the fountain at 16 feet. So we, Seamus Saratani uh, with SDC Concrete, did the pad. So, and I was there when he did it. We poured the pad. It was 16 feet, perfect diameter, everything. So I went back to DC where I work out of, and I'm in my office, and he calls me. Um, because after the pad was down, you put up the walls and then you dry pack concrete into the walls. And he's, he calls me and he says, Pat, we've got two extra pieces of the pool walls. And, and he goes, they won't fit on the pad we poured. 
we were scratching our head. We're like, how? I mean, did they send us when we had the fountain re redone? Did they send us the wrong fountain back or whatever? So I'm like, all right, I'll be there tomorrow or this weekend. So I, I came up. And unique to our fountain, there's, if you look at it, there's like a connector that connects the pool walls, which made it bigger than traditionally what the Fisk company that made the fountain normally did, Yeah. which added two feet to the diameter of the pool. Mm. So we had to take it all apart again and pour a cap on top of the pad we just poured to make it 18 feet in diameter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And Seamus was donating all his time. The concrete was donated. Um, you know, everything was donated. And so it just was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they had to cap it, but it, it turned out fine. and It worked out. So the, those were two snafus right out of the gate we were dealing with. Um, another random one, just quickly. So we get the fountain back and we place them. And he was, and we get them all you know, constructed and we put the, the fireman on top of the fountain. He's facing the jail. <laughs> like, what? Uh, yeah, and we, we did all the screws right. So we're up, I mean, we were up there for at least two hours and people are congregating and you know, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? How is the fireman, so when the fireman was placed, not a lot of people know this, he was tilted so he was looking at Central Fire Station. Oh. So that would be north, the, um, northeast. Yeah. He was cop guy and he was looking at the, where the old jail is. So, like, so we're looking at it. So what they did when they did the restoration, um, we designed it so at the top, the pool at the the bowl at the top fills used to fill with water and was gravity fed. Right. To prevent leaves from blocking the, the feed, the holes up there, we piped it. Um, so there's actually so it's uh, a direct feed for the water. Correct. Yeah. Um, and doing that, they took the old holes that um, bolted down the statue, and they just cut those up so the hose could get through. So that made him cop guy. So we had to adjust and redo the, the fasteners which hold the, the fireman down, so we could get him back to where he was looking at Central State. I mean, you know, you're just like. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like he's not supposed to be looking at the jail. <laughs> and this is on top of the large amount of money you guys had to raise. We raised, so we've spent on the, the restoration so far, and we're still wrapping up some things, but we spent $120,000. We've raised, we raised at least that much in the past um, three years. Um, I think we probably raised in the 130 to 140 range. So we're wow. still in the black. Uh, and that's through our golf tournament we do every year. That's for chicken barbecues, Monte Carlo night, which is Saturday. Um, whole, and the bricks. The bricks were a big big fundraiser for us. Yeah. Memorial bricks out in front. Yeah. But we're up to, we've sold 781 bricks. Wow. And then we continue to get orders for them. So, so you've hit the tipping point. The, you get over so many bricks sold, now a lot of people want them. Yeah. And... So the bricks are between Maine and the fountain, and that space holds, we estimate, based on the square footage, about 900 bricks. Um, so, yeah, we're getting close to having to go on the other side. you got a lot of grass towards the corner. Yeah, <laughs> we, we laid four, over 4,000 bricks wow. for the whole project. So. Wow. And that's all the same host team members that do the races, also do all the fundraising, and they did a lot of the work over there, all you know, volunteer. In addition to that, we're all part of the fire department, so we do all the fire department stuff. Yeah. And in addition to that, they, you know, we all have families and all that stuff. Sure. So the core folks on the host team, there's about you know, 20 to 30 that are, you know, make things happen. Um, they really tip their hat to them because they, you know, they step up time and time again. And you'll see at Monte Carlo tomorrow, we'll have you know twenty or thirty guys that are, and girls down there doing work in the games. And yeah. So it's uh, it's a good good thing. What do you see coming in the future for the host teams organization? I know the uh, Weagle Fire Department uh, not too far away. I think the two hundredth anniversary is coming up in about nine years. 1828, right? Was 1828. 1828, you know, yeah. Things of that, and then 
uh, entity, you know, things that the host team could be doing. What do you see for the future of the next several years so with the host team? The host team incorporated as a not for profit in 15. November, actually in November of 15. And part of that was to continue the operations of the Firematic races, but we also wanted to take on a community project. And our first project was the fountain. Yeah. So now the fountain's wrapped up. We're, we're, there's two things on the immediate horizon. The first being the Central New York Firemen's Association Convention happens around the state every year. And we go the host team in partnership with the fire department will be hosting the 127 annual convention next July here in Oviedo. And that'll be July 9th through the 12th. And that's a pretty big deal. Like I said, the association is made up of 20 counties. So it's every fire department and firefighter in that county are part of the association. It's gonna have an impact in Oviedo for sure. It will definitely have an impact. So we've already got a preliminary schedule which will include hose races, which will include fireworks, which will include a big firefighters parade. The last time we go hosted that uh, convention was in 2010. So we hosted every couple years. Interestingly enough, historically, Frank Baker, an Owego fire chief back in the 1800s, started the Central New York Firemen's Association. He actually started the Firemen's Association, helped start the Firemen's Association in New York as well. But when he started the Century York Firemen's Association, he was its first president. And the first convention in 1893 was in Auburn. The second one was in Ithaca in 1894. And then in 1895, it was in Oligo. So this is the 125th wow. anniversary this next July of it being in Oligo. So wow. there's that, that history. So that the host team's working on that. We're going to. Uh, pay for a lot of that stuff through our fundraising and then the second project we're toying with and I think we've jumped into it is Owego is blessed to have the Owego Fire Department is blessed to have an 1886 steamer it was a, a, an original piece of our fire department that was purchased from a company in New Hampshire called the Moskeg uh, Boiler Steam Company and that steamer is horse drawn Folks have probably seen it in parades and stuff. It hasn't been operational since the mid eight, mid 1980s. So we're going to do a two prong approach to it. Um, number one, we're going to try and get it operational again. Jim Mead, who owns uh, the antique store over here, the old Newberries, is probably the only one in the area who actually understands how it works. <laughs> There was a gentleman of the fire department named Bob Kishbaugh who passed away in 04. It was kind of his baby and his project, yeah. and everybody just let Bob tinker with it and sure. do whatever. So, and Jim was kind of his partner in that. So we're gonna get it operational again, which estimates right now we're getting are in the 30 to 40,000 range yeah. to actually get the steamer to steam and pump water. Again. Right. The second piece of that, and this is Jim Morris's brainchild, our fire chief, there's a steamer house. So Marathon Fire Department in Cortland County has a similar steamer. Yeah. And they built this beautiful steamer house for it. Uh, their, their steamer. I think I've heard of that. Yeah. So we are exploring how we can build a similar steamer house and where to locate it. Um, the steamer house that they built in Marathon cost them about forty thousand dollars. It's really beautiful. It's like a mini fire station that only fit that piece in it. Yeah. And it's got one of their antique bells on the top, and so yeah. I think those uh, the steamer and the steamer house will be our next project. And based on what we were able to do with the found to raise, so essentially you're talking to probably a hundred thousand dollar project again. Yeah. Um, to do that and we need to find a location for it um, which we're currently exploring different options so uh, it'll probably take us three to four years not only to raise the funds but to make that happen and there's only so many companies left in the world that can service and do this stuff and yeah Jim knows them because he's involved in that circuit yeah uh, with, you know trains and, and Jim's an interesting guy and so he knows where the steamer needs to go to get fixed. And his recommendation at this point, I'm actually meeting with him uh, later this afternoon to go over some things. But there's a company in Canada, 
actually that works on boilers and does this type of work. So I see. We might and they visited uh, Jim I think four years ago and looked at our steamer. Basically the boiler's cracked on the, the piece yep. that needs and needs to be replaced. So, so those are two things that we we got coming. So. Well I, you know the more I look at the hose teams and the Weagle Fire Department, it's its just too big of a story with too much history to, to do it justice in one setting. I really encourage people to go and take a look at the websites and and support what's going on there. Sounds like you've got things well in hand for the next few years. Certainly you've been through one big fundraising project already, you know what you're getting into now. So um, I appreciate you coming in today, Pat, and thank you very much yeah, thank for your you. information. Thank you, appreciate it. We may uh, try and pick your brain in the future again for things. Happy to help, and we appreciate all your support. Um, when the Fountain Project kicked off, you did the original video for us right on the onset of things, and always sponsor a golf tournament, and you, know, you, and you bought a couple of bricks. So <laughs> appreciate well, that, too. Thank you, Pat.